Hello, everyone. <laughs> okay, so let's start off immediately, right? Uh, to start off, I'm going to need a little bit of help from you. I have a question. It's a very simple question. How many of you actually believe in the weather forecast that you get in India? Can you raise your hands if you do? <laughs> oh, wow, okay. <laughs> so there are quite a few skeptics. I mean, I can see less than 10% of the people raising their hands. Now, my question is, if you don't believe the weather prediction, why would you believe the climate prediction? I mean, it's a lot more complex, right? We can't even uh, predict the weather right now. Most people think that when meteorologists are predicting the weather, we are using something extremely sophisticated. And the example of that is this. Do you know what this is? This is a magic rock. It's a magic weather prediction rock that a friend has been very kind to bring to me today. So if this rock is dry, it's not raining. If, ooh, <laughs> if this rock is wet, sorry, <laughs> then it's raining, right? If the rock is gone, then, oh, it was a tornado. <laughs> or you were extremely drunk, one of the two. <laughs> so most people think that weather prediction actually follows something like this. And if the weather prediction is not good, how can you believe the climate prediction? Now, when you hear about climate change, you hear about some really big things, right? So climate change is the biggest crisis that's facing humankind. Or you hear some milestones. For example, the Arctic ice is going to disappear by 2100. Or the sea level is going to rise by 2.5 meters in some areas of the world by 2100. Do you know, the sea level rise of 2.5 meters, if that happens in Mumbai, it's going to change the geography of Mumbai completely. Quite a few areas will be underwater, as you can see in the blue. And also, you know that new airport that we are building over there in Navi Mumbai? You won't go there to get a flight. You'll go there to get a boat. <laughs> so these are big things. But the question is, how do scientists know this? Because as you all said, you know, the weather prediction itself is not believable. And everything is so complex. So how in the world can we believe the climate prediction? Well, in reality, for weather predictions, there, have two things, uh, there are two things that have changed recently. Right? The first thing is, until 1994, we used to use what are known as statistical models. So basically, if in the last 30 years it rained an X amount, the most likely amount of rainfall today will be X. Very simple. And honestly, it was probably the best thing they could do at that point. But since 1994, we have started using physics. <laughs> So you all know about Newton's laws, right? If you know the mass of a body, and you know the force that you apply to it, you can predict extremely well what direction it's going to go in and at what speed it will go, right? So very simple physics. The atmosphere also follows very similar physical laws. Of course, they are a lot more complex, but they are simple physical laws. If you have the information, you should be able to predict it. But they're pretty complicated because there are so many laws that govern the atmosphere. So the second big change has been computation. So now we actually have the resources to be able to analyze all the physics and hence give accurate predictions. But does this, has this really changed? Let me give you one striking example. In 1999, there was this big cyclone that hit Orissa, and about 10,000 people died. You, some of you must remember this, right? So this was about 10,000 people dying because of one cyclone in Orissa. You know this number of 10,000? It's much higher than the number of people who died during the 9-11 attacks in the US. So it's a significant number. And then 20 years later, which is in fact this year, another cyclone hit Orissa. And this cyclone was about the same magnitude, but the number of deaths was 72. So 72 is still a huge number according to me, but you can see the huge difference that has happened in the weather predictions, right? And the reason this number came so low is because the weather prediction was actually excellent. And because it was excellent and the government had confidence in it, it was able to act on this. And because it acted on it, the number of people who died was much, much less. The lesson in all of this is that the science works. And if you can actually solve the physics properly, you can predict the weather. And if you can predict the weather, you can predict the climate. Because what is climate? if not long-term weather, right? So before we start on to how we get to climate prediction, let's go and look at the past. So is the world really changing? 
is climate change real, or are we all just getting soft, like some people have claimed? Right? <laughs> so let's look at the data, because that's where we start off. On the left-hand side, what you'll see are these lovely blue colors, and on the right-hand side are these red colors. Blue is the past, red is the present. Over the last couple of decades, you can see, oh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that this is over the last 118 years. So all the red is essentially over the last couple of decades, and you can see that the temperature is definitely increasing. I was born in, uh, in, in 1982, so I'm 37 years old. And honestly, when I was young, I don't remember temperatures being that high. How many of you used air conditioners in Pune when you were young? Was it very common? From my memory, it definitely isn't. And it's not as if it wasn't warm. We live in the tropics, right? So summers were always warm, but they were not unbearably hot. But that has changed now, because it shows that the temperature has been increasing. And it's not just getting warm, but it's getting unbearably warm. No wonder we are hearing things like heat waves. Did you ever hear this wo word when we were young? But OK, fine, the temperatures increase. Why should we complain about it? We can all just buy an air conditioner, sit in it, be comfortable, right? So what's the danger in it? Unfortunately, it's not just the temperature. Along with temperature, something that drives the entire economy of the country, rainfall, that's also changing. So the amount of rainfall in certain parts of India has reduced drastically over the last 60 years. No wonder we are starting to hear things like water crisis, right? It's all a reality. But fine, water amount of rainfall is reducing, but is that so dangerous for life? Along with the rainfall, unfortunately, what's also increasing a lot is these extreme events. So these are events when the rainfall falls, but falls very rapidly, very hard over a short period of time. And that causes loss of economy, loss of life, etc. And you're seeing the effects of it. I mean, right now, we have some floods happening in Kolhapur. Did you ever hear about a flood in Kolhapur in the past? So all this shows that it's really happening, right? And honestly speaking, we are very lucky. You know, we are the sheltered urban people. We know how to survive. The people who are really feeling the pinch of this are the farmers. Because their crops, they cannot handle this kind of change. They will never be able to adapt so quickly. So all the data that we see right now, until present, shows us that, yes, climate change is definitely happening. And it's happening at a staggering rate. So the question is, fine, it's happening now, but what will happen in the future? Is it going to be more worrying, or will it get better? How do you start predicting the, uh, the future climate? In terms of predicting, let's start off with something very simple, OK? I want you to think of a conceptual model. A mo model. So let's take a box. Yeah? This is a box, and there's a parameter called x inside the box. The amount of x in the box is going to be controlled by the inflow and the outflow. Very simple. If you think x is the earth, oh, sorry, if you think the box is the earth, then x is the temperature. The amount of inflow is essentially the solar energy, because that's our base of bas basic energy. And the outflow is what is being radiated back into space. The inflow in terms of solar energy, that we know extremely well. We can calculate it, we can measure it extremely well. And honestly speaking, it does not change so much over a few decades. Okay? So we have a good control on that. The outflow is what is being changed by these things called greenhouse gases. These greenhouse gases essentially trap the radiation that's escaping out into space. So if you trap more energy in the atmosphere, then of course it's going to get hotter. And as I showed you in that figure, that colorful image, yes, the data shows it. It is definitely getting, ha uh, getting hotter. So the science seems to be quite accurate, right? But, you know, it's a very simple model. And as all of you must know, anything that looks simple rarely is, right? So there's a lot more complexity that we need to think about. For example, how much energy is going to be transported from the tropical areas to the polar regions? Or how much are these greenhouse gases going to change by in the future? Or how much energy are the oceans going to absorb? Are the plants going to change? Is the vegetation going to change as a result of climate change? These are pretty complex questions. And that's why we deviate away from the simple model. When we think about climate modeling, we also started off in a very similar way. We just had the atmosphere. 
right? It was very similar to our box. And then we realized if we want to give accurate predictions, then we need to add more complexity into it. And then we added more complexity in terms of adding the land, the ocean, the chemistry, the vegetation, all of these things went into the model. In fact, the models have become so good that it's basically a small Earth inside the computer that we simulate now. And the models have become virtually unrecognizable from the models that were in existence 50 years back. You know, the kind of revolution that has happened in climate modeling is the same as in telecommunication. You know, when we were young, we used to have like this landline that we used to hold and then try and call our girlfriend and sit by the phone for hours and hours, right? But now you're all carrying these supercomputers in your pockets. That's the kind of revolution that has also happened in climate modeling. And although this huge revolution has happened, the science has stayed the same, right? It's still trying to solve that basic equation. Along with the science, unfortunately, the message has also stayed the same. What has changed a lot is the uncertainty on that message. So now we can say with a lot more confidence that the future climate is not going to be the same as now. We can say with a lot more confidence that we are going to live in India, which will have erratic rainfall. We can say with a lot more confidence that heat waves are going to become a norm. We are going to live in a country with floods and droughts, where places like Chennai run out of water, while places like Mumbai get inundated with devastating floods. And what we can see from the results of all these models is that climate change is 100% real. And along with it being 100% real, we would be extremely foolish not to do something about it. So the point I want you to, think, to take back with you is, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, climate change is not real, or the uncertainties are too large, I would not tell them that they are wrong. I would say that they're living in the past. And I certainly hope that all of you will not. Thank you.